and welcome to Dragon Talk. This is a lore you should know segment. It is uh, where me, Greg Tito, speaks to these amazing lore masters, Mr. Chris Perkins. Hello. And Matt Cernit. Howdy. On little bits of Dungeons & Dragons lore uh, from the Forgotten Realms that you can use in your game or just for the fun of knowing them and springing them on your friends. Yeah. Uh, We had one very recently uh, that we want to uh, have an addendum to, a correction, uh, if it were. We talked about the GIF, G-I-F-F. Uh, uh, who are detailed. Flying space hippo men. Yes. Hippo uh, women. From the spell jammer. Uh, hippo in space. Exactly. Yes. They, they do have ships. Yes, we said they didn't have ships, but in fact they do have at least yeah. one ship. There was a deck plan for the GIF Bombard, which is basically a Yamato gun. Yeah, great, um, great Bombard, yeah. The Great a, Bombard. And is, it's a giant cannon that fills up the entire deck of the ship. <laughs> and it fires five-foot diameter cannonballs. <laughs> <laughs> five-foot <laughs> diameter. <laughs> yes. Problem is that the GIF, because they don't have spellcasters, need a spellcaster to power their uh, Great Bombard helm. So yes. yeah. where they get these spellcasters, does anybody guess who would want to serve on a ship that's basically all one big cannon. Hmm? I don't know. <laughs> so, so the interesting thing is that, like, there's there's some idea that the GIF hi- hire a mercenary wizard to to, yes. to pilot their ship for them, which is funny because they are all mercenaries. mercenaries yeah. <laughs> so they have to. It's like a subcontractor. Yeah, yes. they, they adopt right. a wizard. I don't know. Yeah. So there is a GIF ship out there. Enjoy. Sweet. Well, thank you. I'm glad we had that all like wrapped up. Yeah. Uh, the GIF will be in Morning Canyon's Tome of Foes, uh, which comes out on May 18th. Everywhere else, May 29th. Uh, you can find out more about it there. But we are going to talk about a different piece of D&D lore for this entire segment. The country of Cormier. Or Cormier. 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 Yep. What is it about Cormier? What do, what's, what's the shtick there? Boy, it's... A lot has been written. <laughs> yeah, a lot has been written. I think um, there are things about Cormier that people who like Arthurian legends can relate to. Oh, I think okay. that's part of their appeal. Uh, there's there's uh, there's an undercurrent in a lot of the stories of Cormier from uh, sort of the second and third edition era where King Azown is the king, where it's sort of like a Henry V kind of vibe. Mm. Um, he goes out in disguise as, as sort of a... a a uh, normal citizen and um, wanders about and does various things, gets into various shenanigans. Um, and his sort of court wizards, the war wizards, uh, sort of um, help protect him while he does that and stuff in, like that. Incognito? Like yeah. they're, they're also in secret? and Yeah. So, so that's the, it, there's the weird thing about Cormier is that uh, – it has this sort of Arthurian legend kind of feel to it because there's this good king on the throne for most of the the settings history, mm-hmm. and um, people think of it as uh, you know ye old Arth- Arthurian times uh, type thing. Um, he goes out and he fights um, Yaman Kahan, who is basically the Forgotten Realms version of uh, my brain fell out. The Genghis Khan kind of coming over and invading okay. and so on. Right. So again, again, it's sort of like he's this this good guy who's doing all this great stuff. Um, but it's a little bit weird because it is a country that has serfs and they're lorded over by various barons and various, um, other rankings of Cormorian nobility. Um, and there is this sort of secret police state of the war wizards who spy on everyone and report back, um, what is being said in various courtrooms of various nobles and stuff like that. And yeah. And so yeah. it's it's sort of this bizarre mix of, uh, yay, the shining city on the hill, and then our, also also this weird police state of war wizards and so on. Where and where is it in relation to say the Sword Coast, Neverwinter, uh, 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 Waterdeep, that type of thing? East. <laughs> East. <laughs> yeah. So um, there's the big body of water in the center of the, the Forgotten Realms setting the main continent and the Sea of Fallen Stars. And so it is on sort of the north <laughs> western end of that. And uh, as you head inland, there's a bunch of mountains on either side, and you kind of get funneled towards that space of Cormier. Um, and a lot of travel that um, heads across sort of the continent goes through that sort of Cormier area. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so it's within the same kind of, you know, uh, it's like two days travel from the coast, that type of thing, three days, four days. Like it's, it's quite, yeah, it's ways away. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's, that's yeah. why it feels Long very trip away. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, of its own thing. Uh, yeah. And uh, I like that. It, what you mentioned, it's got this, it's basically medieval, which is 
highs and then lots of yeah. lows. Yeah. And it's also very, it's political. So if you like running political uh, campaigns with lots of court intrigue, mm. Cormier is one of the places to do it. Mm -hmm. And were there lots of campaigns set there? Is that why there's so much written about it? There's a lot of novels that have been set there and dealt with those characters, um, particularly by Ed Greenwood. Um, the most recent one was probably, uh, well, must be, I think, uh, Ashes of the Tyrant. Mm -hmm. I think Tyrant. Of, yeah, I'm gonna mess up the title. Oh, oh the shoot, the Aaron M. Evans. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, Aaron's book. Yes. Um, and uh, and that has um, uh, a fair amount of it that deals with sort of like court intrigue and who's on the throne and so on. So by the end of that, we we know that it's uh, Queen. I think I'm gonna mispronounce, but I think it's Rieradra, um, who is now sort of Queen of of Cormier. But got it. Um, and uh, why, how did it get formed? Why was why were this uh, war wizards have so much power? Was it always this one monarch, or was there a long lineage before then? Well, there there is a long lineage before that that you can trace through. Which like, I'm not supposed to ask. <laughs> <laughs> that lore. Well, it's basically lore that was created as backfill. So, I see. so when the setting was first generated and Ed was making it, um, you know, there it was created with King Zaun and the War Wizards and uh, this whole sort of setup and so on. And uh, so he then wrote a number of novels that deal with characters in this area and, and so on. But then the, the sort of long history of that that setting uh, was filled in later. Mm. Um, and so there's all kinds of weird yeah. little wrinkles like uh, the, the Purple Dragons, which are the sort of army of Cormier, relates back to um, what was called a purple dragon, which was this sort of actual dragon that the, the great ancestor of King Azaun fought and so on and so forth, and it comes back later. And it, yeah, it's a yeah. very complicated. But to be clear, they don't have actual dragons defending them now. The purple dragons are a knightly order. Yes. Right, right, yeah. filling, in, filling in for yeah. the Arthurian yeah. type of feel, like Knights of the Round Table mm -hmm. type thing. Right, yeah. and, it, and that even that part's a little bit weird because um, throughout the second edition period, uh, the purple dragons were just the army of the, the, the crown. Uh, and the purple dragon knight idea didn't really come in until third edition, and that was sort of solidified in third and fourth. And that was the idea that there was sort of this... Um, if you were uh, a hero of the, the kingdom and so on, you might be inducted into the Purple Dragon Knights. And so that became sort of more of a, a real thing. Mm. But even that was sort of like a thing that kind of erupted in the game and in the lore of the, the books and so on later on. I think on. it was even a prestige class in yes. third edition. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's the genesis of that. And a lot of people liked it, so I kind of like, oh, here, let's write some more. Uh, yeah. backstory about it to make well, it more sense. Well, it fits right in with the, with the setting, you know, that sort of Arthurian legend feel and so on. Um, and I think previously there wasn't, the re there, I mean, there was the concept of certainly knights in the kingdom, but it was still, still that sort of medieval, um, you know, uh, fealty kind of system with scutage and, you know, all that kind of a thing where you have to, you know, give the king so many warriors and, you know, all that kind of deal. So. Yeah. How, how big of an area is uh, Cormier? Ooh. I mean, does it involve like one city, or is it like oh, several no. city states with like that kind it, of well, idea? It all, it's a entire. It's a kingdom, so all of the places within Cormier, you know, right, sort of funnel up to the king or right. queen, as it as it happens now. Uh, the biggest city is the capital city of Suzail, which is on the coast of the Sea of Fallen Stars. Okay, but there are other good sized cities and a plethora of towns and villages scattered throughout. Um, it's safe to say it's a it's sort of a well-documented, well-trodden realm. There aren't a lot, within Cormier, there aren't a lot of places of mystery, uncharted reaches. Mm. Um, the place is pretty well mapped out. And so if you're gonna go off on an adventure in the classic sense, there are lots of dungeons still around Cormier, along the outskirts of Cormier, in the mountains and in the woods that surround Cormier. Um, and even within Cormier itself. But people probably know of them unless there's some super secret hidden mystery place mm. that nobody has yet uncovered. Um, uh, these places have been sort of chronicled and mapped, put on the map. Right. As being like, these, yeah. are, these are problem areas, don't right. stay away. Yeah. When you look or at a map of Cormier compared to some of the other realms, mm -hmm. uh, it's got a lot more identified places on it. And that's because, as Matt says, a lot of novels has been set here. A lot of names have been dropped over the years, and so there's a fair amount that has been plotted out, and and you know a lot of stakes put in the ground. Yeah, which, as you say, makes uh, 
rife for political intrigue campaigns where like right. oh it's this town that we have the name of versus this town and yep. you know the baron doesn't like that one yep. and so how to work around that yeah so. one of the first adventures i ever ran that was fr based uh, takes place in a dungeon on sort of on the edge of cormier called the haunted halls of evening star which ed greenwood wrote and it's very much sort of a classic dnd dungeon crawl mm -hmm. um, not not sort of full of necessarily the political intrigue that you expect or that sort of came about as Cormier was being developed got it in later editions was uh was was what was the name of the purple dragon that was actually oh, oh gosh oh gosh I'd have to look it up Stumped. okay <laughs> yeah I don't know I wasn't sure if that's, that's where the name that's Cormier in the way, that's came in the from. way back or is that where just the king's uh, heritage came from I'm, I'm doing a little looking here yeah. for uh I would say that Cormier is maybe about uh, half the size of France, something like that. Okay, that sound that sound about. about yeah, mm -hmm. just being so basic. like the the you know the the Ireland of England, uh, you know, plus Ireland maybe as a as a thing that makes sense. Um, so if uh, you wanted to set a character. Uh, from there, or like you know, ha integrate Cormier into your campaign. Uh, as you said, the political intrigue thing makes sense, but someone who's a knight or a paladin uh, would make perfect sense. What about uh, one of these war wizards? Oh, sure, yeah. You could even go sort of the. Um, I mean, there are lots of wilderness places around Cormier, so you know they're probably orcs living in the mountains so you can have half orc characters running mm. around you've got elves living in the wood the forests to the north cormanthor places like that so you can have elves and half elves running around um what's what's cormanthor so cormanthor is a, a sort of big forest area um it's related to cormanthir which was a big forest kingdom of the elves an empire of the elves at one time um for a long period in the Forgotten Realms history, so yeah, there's okay. a there's a it's a huge, huge forest tract north of Cormier. I think it's as big, if not bigger, than Cormier itself. Yeah, and um, around that sort of in the, around all the sort of edges of that forest is the basically what's called the Dale Lands. Um, and Cormier and the Dale Lands have had a long sort of fractious history. They've had wars over I think Scardale, mm -hmm. um, which is sort of in the mountains, in and. Uh, all kinds of yeah. There's just so much that's sort yeah. of tied to it. Yeah. Um, mm. Wars with Zambia. Um, the it's, that's his eastern neighbor. Yeah. I see. And uh, there's there's just a bunch of yeah, okay. So so Cormant Cormant Theodore was a uh, elvish in, kingdom in the forest of the same north, name north of Cormier. Got it. Um, it later after the kingdom went away. Yeah. Uh, as many elven kingdoms do. Uh, it became just known as the land of Cormanthor or the forest of Cormanthor. Okay. Yeah. There's no there's no elves that live there currently. Oh yeah, I'm oh, sure. Yeah. yeah so some um yeah, yeah and it's I guess it's more east but whatever. Uh it's uh like it's where Mithranor was and mm. so during the fourth edition period, Mithranor and third edition period, Mithranor was sort of resurrected as a new elven city. But then in the Sundering, the events of the Sundering novels, um uh the Empire of Shade, which was in Anorak, and Cormier went to war, and then Shade sort of passed over, the Flying Citadels passed over Cormier in order to invade um, the Cormanthor and attack Mithranor, and Mithranor got destroyed, and read lots of novels. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but the quick pricey is that Mithranor is no more. Yes. It is, uh, is a ruin once again. Is yeah. a ruin once again, but there are still elves. Now, how does the humans of Cormier... Uh, what, what do they think about the elves that live in Cormanthor? Um, I, th I think that, so there's a weird thing where the Dale Lands have this, what's, what's, I think it's called the Dale Compact, but it's basically what's, what made the, um, the calendar start at uh, 1 DR. That's Dale Reckoning. Oh. So they, they made a bargain with the elves way, way back when, about whatever, 14, uh, 180 years ago or so. Um, and said, uh, we aren't going to cut any of the real, um, you know, living trees of the forest anyway. We're only going to take dead wood. And as long as we do that, you guys will let us live on the edges of your forest. Mm -hmm. And the elves said, okay. And uh, their version of saying okay was to make a super magical item um, or object thing that uh, is this stone, this indestructible stone, um, that is the point at which that sort of compact was made. And as long as both parties keep the bargain, the stone is indestructible, it's got other magical properties. Um, 
And so they've the Dale Lands people been, basically have kept that, that bargain for you know a thousand and four hundred and eighty years or so. Right. Um, other people, not so much. The Zentarum, uh, the people of Cormier, Sembia, and so on, they, they, they are look at that giant, vast woodlands with all the resources in it and say, hey, what's going on, guys? Like, come on. <laughs> this was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Nobody even remembers The elves are this. gone. They yeah. left. Like, <laughs> elves are like, no, we're still <laughs> here. No, I, I lived over there for <laughs> 10 centuries. Yeah. Our uh, kingdom's gone, but we're still here. Yeah. So, yeah, and so that's that's kind of the thing that's going on there. Is that, so Cormier, Cormier, I think, looks at looks with avarice at that area um, because it is it is sort of the good kingdom, but it it has this aspect of of conquest and expansion, expansion, and yeah, so on. So. I see, but they don't have any specific animosity towards elves. Uh, but they yeah, lo- yeah. look at that as, as resources that they should grab. Right, I got yes. it. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, what, what else is what are like uh, other than them it being a human uh, uh, country? Uh, are there uh, uh, halflings, gnomes? Like, is it, is it made up of, of yeah, a diverse sort of full panoply of yeah. of D and D races um, scattered throughout? But it's predominantly human, like Those ni- ninety power. plus percent, ninety five plus percent human. Got it. And uh, uh, do they, uh, you know, is it uh, warrior uh, kind of based because of the feudal nature? Is it more knights and, and things like that? Are there other yeah, things looked I mean, down upon? With the exception of the, the war wizard. So, I mean, it's one of those things. I, I think if you're in Cormier and you show some aptitude for wizardry or sorcery or something along those lines, the war wizards come and knock on your door. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> come and knock on our door. So, Welcome, um, child. And Get there, you into a, our war college. A funny thing about Cormier as well, where uh, for, it's a longstanding sort of rule of, of the, the empire, kingdom, whatever you want to call it, that if you're an adventuring band operating in Cormier, you have to register. Mm. So, you know, it, like adventuring is recognized as a thing that people do, and it's like a profession, you know. And uh, you have to register and like pay up taxes and fees and so on to um, do the th- your thing in Cormier. And if you don't, basically your adventuring is considered illegal and you can be seized or your goods can be seized or oh. you might be put in prison or beheaded or whatever. Yeah. That's so. a good story hook right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You went to the wrong place, didn't pay the permits. <laughs> uh, all right, then final question. What, what's going on with the, the queen? You said what, what's, what's the kind of state of affairs in Cormier right now? So um, the, the, the events of the Sundering and the fallout from that are relatively recent. The, um, at the same time that there was a war going on with um, Sembia and with uh, the... Um, Kingdom of Shade. Yeah, Empire Kingdom of Shade. Of Shade. And so on. There was a, a sort of internal conflict in, in Cormier about who was going to have the throne, a big struggle over that. And so the fallout of that basically more or less just happened. It's like in the current timeline of the, the realms, it's probably happened in just like the last year or two or three. Oh, okay. And so Queen Riedra is a relatively new queen. Um, she's uh, obviously was a princess of some sort before that, but... Um, you know, I, that's still, the dust sort of is still settling there. Um, there's a weird thing where um, uh, the, the court wizard of the kingdom, Van, Vander... Vander Haggist. Van, yeah, well, however you pronounce it. <laughs> I always have trouble <laughs> with that one. We'll go with um, that. He, uh, like, I think he was a sp- weird spider creature for a really long time. <laughs> and then he like, was trapped in that form. And then I think in one of the novels he came back and basically um fell in love with a dragon and then like he's so he's sort of back but not really in a weird way and his his sort of uh successor another v named wizard of pronouncableness <laughs> <laughs> is kind of also around think i think as well too but that person might be i don't remember anyways the it's complicated the war wizards are are, are generally just complicated yeah. yes yeah yes. It, so it, it it behooves me to mention that Cormier has long been one of Ed Greenwood's favorite playgrounds, mm. and he has had his characters tromping around there in a number of novels, and Elminster shows up in meddling in Cormierian affairs from time to time, and he's got a relationship with this Van, Van der Haggist fellow. Uh, oh, there. I see. So, yeah. Uh, like a rival, or we, or... Uh, so, in, like, one of the uh, Therian legend things that comes out of Cormier is that you really get the sense that um, King Azown and Vanger de Hast yep. <laughs> is, That's right. is, is like 
<laughs> the the uh, Arthur and uh, Merlin yes. kind of scenario. Got it. Um, and 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 so it, their their relationship is is close like that, and so they're kind of buddies in in a lot of ways and a lot of. The but novels. Merlin is not always they're both highly eccentric wizards. Yes, so um, their relationship is understandably complex. Yeah, and so like the uh, and I think Elminster is definitely a free spirit by comparison. Whereas uh, Vangi, as he's often called, Vangi, literally yes. that's his nickname. Uh, All right, good old Vangi. Uh, he is part of this sort of weird police state and secret police system, mm. um, and the head of it at, for a long period of time. More more lawful than yeah. to Elminster's chaotic, and and not necessarily as good. Right. <laughs> that's why I didn't. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, there's a, a weird quinking too I wanted to bring up is that uh, there's a period of history in, in the, the setting where um, a character known as Gondagal um, rises up and tries to start a rebellion in Cormir. And uh, for whatever reason, that guy actually ends up eventually in Ravenloft. And so he got, he got pulled over into the dark side of Ravenloft for that, I guess. In, in the second edition Yeah, in the second there? edition period, yeah. So he's he's a character that w- hmm. got pulled in Ravenloft. So. I don't even remember that. Yep. That's, all right, so he's got his own domain of dread. We'll yep. just give it to him. Cormier has its own coinage. I just want to let people know that. That's important. Um, yes, it is. So copper pieces are called thumbs. Silver pieces are called falcons. Four fingers. Gold pieces are called lions. And platinum pieces are called tri-crowns. And electron pieces, I guess, are called garbage. Because <laughs> <laughs> they don't not exist. On the list. <laughs> right. Are the tri-crowns uh, uh, triangles? Uh, that would make a lot of sense. That would make it? a lot of sense, yeah. right? Yeah. It's well, probably because they have three crowns on it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that also probably makes sense. I suspect that's the yeah. case. Uh, all right, good to know. All right, great. Uh, that's your uh, uh, quick bit on Cormier. Uh, Matt mentioned a whole bunch of novels uh, that you can read for more backstory, but... Uh, we will be uh, flushing out more core for your Cormier soon. Right. And we, we haven't actually um, gone to great lengths to, f- to describe Cormier publicly up to this point because it is a place in 5th edition that we haven't really gone to right. and sort of rooted a story in yet. So um, yeah. that, that may change in the future as we continue to expand outward from the north. And as uh, you can probably tell, it has a lot of canon associated with it. So yeah. Figuring out has all how to canon. do it. <laughs> it's it's, diff- you know, like it's a lot to yeah. relate and volumes figure out. And, yeah, and, and volumes track of down. Yeah. Right. It's like so. a cannon with a, uh, a five foot yeah. in diameter <laughs> cannonball. There but we bump. go. All right. Love nice, it. Nice circle around. <laughs> Tried. Uh, thank you, guys. How can uh, people ask you more questions about uh, Cormier? I am on Twitter at Chris Perkins DND. And I'm on Twitter at, at Cernet, S-E-R-N-E-T-T. And I'm at Greg Tito. Uh, that's been Laurie Janot. Thank you, guys. Uh, we'll be back next week with more. Bye-bye. Excellent. Next. One down, two to go. Uh, we're going to do these quick. Uh, so halflings and gnomes, you want to do that one next? Or did you want to do the, uh, the, the to make sure we get that? Because I knew the longer, the, D, the goofy D&D adventures would be a longer it's one. It's a longer so. one. Halflings and gnomes, it's kind of like... They're really wishy-washy. Yeah. <laughs> and we are. firm them up. Right. And they're in, I mean, they're talked about at length in Morty Cadence. Yeah. But uh, I guess we can talk a little bit about them at, in terms of like, hey, they've got their own gods. And hey, they have their own, well, some of them have their own natural enemies. Right. Yeah. All right. So yeah, we can yeah. talk about them in yeah. general terms. Sure. It, yeah. Sure. It's not going to be we'll pretty see. specific. I'm not sure where the conversation is going to go, but whatever. Need, hey, let's make it up yeah. as we go. It's yeah. Like, it's like a D&D campaign. All right. Ready to record the second one? Halflings and yeah. gnomes. Halflings and gnomes. Gnomes and halflings. It's good to be short. <laughs> I've been playing a lot of uh, halflings lately because I'm like, oh, man. I love playing a halfling. You don't get enough, like, super badass halflings very often, so that's what I've been so trying to go dark with. son. Well, yes, of course. Well, they're <laughs> – yeah. well, next, <laughs> next session. Welcome to Lore You Should Know. Uh, I am Greg Tito, and I'm joined by these amazing lore masters, Mr. Chris Perkins. Hello. And Matt Cernit. Hello. And in this segment, we talk about little bits of D&D lore that you can... Little bits. Little bits. (laughs) uh, Very tiny, short bits uh, that you can use in your game uh, or for the funsies. And in this one, it's going to be about little uh, peoples, the gnomes and halflings of the Forgotten Realms, where they all come from, some of the pantheons, uh, how they've been described uh, as being a part of the world of Faerun. Uh, so let's start with halflings. Uh, where, where are in the mythology do halflings come from in the Forgotten Realms? Boy, I don't actually know where they come from. They just 
Yeah, they, they just, just are. Always, they just are. They just are. Yeah, because yeah. it's funny because there, there's other Somebody origin stories for rock. It's like, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> hey, <laughs> I'm Frodo. There's <laughs> origin <laughs> stories for a lot of races. Like uh, orcs are literally alien invaders to the world. They've been transported into the world. Yeah, elves came from fairy. Yeah, humans were both uh, races that rose up and evolved in from the presumably apes in the world and were invaders. We have both versions of the Forgotten Realms. I don't know where elves or halflings came from. Like, I, I don't. They just were always there. Yeah. Yeah. I, Interesting. For the betterment of all. Where uh, where are some of the first mentions of them in, in the lore, then? Well, they certainly show up um, in the first gray box of Forgotten Realms, mm-hmm. and uh, halflings and, and uh, gnomes are both described there. Uh, the, the sort of wishy-washiness of halflings and gnomes and dwarves and stuff like that kind of starts there and continues. In, in the gray box, initially, they were kind of like... Unimpeded. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, so it, it probably was, we need to make sure that these D&D races are in the Forgotten Realms, so put right. them in there. Yeah. It, it, so they, I mean, they... The, they're, they're both described as races that sort of like to stay at home and uh, like their creature comforts. Um, they're both described as races that um, like nature and live with nature in harmony with nature. Um, they're both short and they're... <laughs> <laughs> you they, can see the trouble cut starts to come in. Were they distinct in, in that gray box that they were yes, like the homes, yes. gnomes and halflings? Were they were distinct, yeah. And gnomes, e- even there, gnomes were even the first gray box were described as a forgotten people. So even gnomes were then even in the gray box sidelined as e- an even more forgotten race than 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 halflings are, mm. um, it, which is interesting. Uh, that is interesting. And yeah. and there were forest gnomes and rock gnomes, and and that was kind of the the big distinction there. Um, I think with halflings, I don't know if we got to all the distinctions that we did in third. I don't think we certainly get to all of them. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it, and it's funny because the, the basic D&D and sort of Greyhawk-style D&D gives you different definitions for halflings. Um, and, you know, Dragonlance had its own thing, which was Kender. Yeah. And so, you know. Um, so, uh, I mean, halflings uh, in D&D lore and history uh, have typically just kind of evolved from the Hobbit idea and how do we use them in there? Is that a sim- a similar in the Forgotten Realms that they kind of had a lot of those characteristics that were Tolkien-esque? I would think that's safe to say. Um, I think that the Forgotten Realms, as Ed conceived it, was taking what was in the core rule set and just finding homes for everything. Yeah. And halflings were present in the player's handbook, so were gnomes. Uh, they were both options. Uh, Ed just wanted to make everything in the player's handbook feel welcome in the setting. Mm-hmm. I think part of the reason why halflings have never been as fully explored historically is because of their demeanor Mm. and the fact that they don't generally wage wars. Typically, history deals with the war telling. Yeah. You know, who conquered whom and took what from whom. Halflings generally don't want any part of that in the realms or anywhere else, at least Unless until you get the dark sun. (laughs) (laughs) Um, (laughs) Another podcast for that one. Exactly. Uh, So uh, you just kind of assume that they've had kind of a quiet history. Yeah. They live in their own. They have their own uh, uh, communities. Right. And if they do travel yes. into human lands, they're, right. you know, they're traitors. Yeah. Or, yeah. Or, uh, yeah. Both both the halflings and the gnomes are talked about in Morden Kanan's Tome of Foes. But one of the things that's called out about halflings is that they don't really have any humanoid enemies mm. or longstanding grudges with other types of humanoids. Yeah. I mean, there, there was an attempt, I think, in previous editions to ha- make them... <coughs> Excuse me. Be enemies of uh, kobolds and, and stuff like that. And the same thing was done with gnomes. Um, it didn't really stick. I don't think. I mean, it kind of, kind of works. Kind of doesn't. Gnomes. Yeah, it yeah. sticks a little bit with gnomes, but yeah. Um, gnomes have a little bit more of a. Uh, you know, they have uh, um, the deity uh, that they follow. Garl Glittergold. Yes, exactly. And and his uh, penchant for creating, tinkering, making things, and trickster is some Mis- sort of trickster. mischief and illusion. Yeah. Yeah, it, again, it's one of those things where uh, there's there's so many kind of things thrown at the gnomes all at once that it's hard to say, like, this is who the gnomes are. Uh, because the gnomes are, you know, illusionists, and they're tinkerers, and they love nature, and can talk to animals. And, <laughs> you know, and it's like, what is going on here? Whereas, you know, something with, with the elves, it's like, okay. They're they're awesome at fighting and they have magic that they're awesome at and they're good in the woods. Okay, got it. Yeah, 
Even that's a lot, though. <laughs> it is, but but you know, it's it's less of a mixed bag, I think, than you get with the gnomes. In uh, uh, in the Forgotten Realms, then, do gnomes offer? Are they uh, do they have a fey characteristic to them? Do they have? Are they elf like? No, in the conception not, of them, not really. No. So there's there's mainly two types of gnomes. Um, there's the sort of the rock, well, three, I guess, the rock gnomes and um, forest gnomes and svervnblin. Uh, so forest gnomes you can think of as like David the gnome uh, in you know the cartoon of the book whatever yeah. uh, and that's pretty much what they are rock gnomes are similar in that they tend to live in hidden away places and burrows under the ground and so on but they are more focused on uh, sort of constructing things and building and, and making tinkering and so on and in Fragment Realms oftentimes that is literally tinkering like making things out of tin mm. um, it's kind of like you know one of the things that they do uh, and you know over the course of editions there's been weird things that happen so like the idea that they're inventors um, is a strong theme but that kind of got borrowed a little bit from uh, Dragonlance where you have the uh, tinker gnomes right. who are just crazy inventors and then um, the sort of steampunky elements of WoW, uh, World of Warcraft, kind of crept in at a certain point in yeah. various editions of the game. And so, again, they kind of got moved all over the map because they, they kind of lacked that central identity. Right, the affinity with Gond uh, yeah. kind of had some of that involved, So too. They, they were associated with Gond, and then, then they were associated with a specific gnome deity that was their own name, um, but it was sort of implied or even said that, that was actually just Gond. Uh, and so, oh, really? yeah, it's, it's, so it, it just went all over the place. So with Morgan Cain's Tome of Foes, we really, with both halflings and gnomes, tried to draw uh, stronger distinctions between them and make them, between each other, the, the two races, and then within the race, make them more distinct and more interesting um, for the, the game and as a whole. Right. Nice. That makes sense. Uh, we skipped over the halfling pantheon just to talk about some of them. So what, uh, you got, what, are, what are some of them within the Forgotten Realms? Um, well, there's Yandala, Yandala is the main one. Uh, she's sort of the the mother goddess, as it were. Um, her symbol is a oh, that's where they her came symbol from. is a cornucopia. Yeah. Oh, all right, that makes sense. Well, that's uh, where they came from. The, the mother goddess. She, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, yeah. there is that is that that is one of the, the sort of legends. She just made them. Yeah. Um, and then there's uh, we'll God, go with that. That makes sense. Yeah. There's Sheila Pararoyal. Pararoyal. Yeah. <laughs> um, and there's, uh, gosh, there's a, there's a, a sort of like a, a defender deity, mm -hmm. and um, I'm going to mix them up with the gnome gods yeah. because we... Because <laughs> yeah, it's very easy to do, but uh, <laughs> suffice to say they're uh, halfling. There are some similarities to Forgotten Realms halflings and hobbits. Um, the, the two types of halflings, Strongheart and Lightfoot, the two main types, there are other types yeah. as well, but yeah. um, basically are aspects of the hobbit personality. Right. The the half of you who wants to just stay home and you know grow carrots, and then the other half of you who wants to run off and do you know new things and explore that river and see where it goes. Have some wanderlust. Exactly. Yeah. So, and the wanderlust element, of course, was picked up and just ran with it with the kender. Um, but the halflings in the Forgotten Realms very much sort of fit into those two camps. Yeah. The ones that you meet out in the wild are the the explorers, and the ones that you meet in the in their small little. Villages are the the strong hearts who are quite happy to stay at home and smoke their pipes and bake their pies and uh, the halflings get along very well with the other races uh, like the the dwar generally speaking the humans and whatnot so it's very common to see halfling communities within human cities like Waterdeep and other settlements of the north yeah um, they're kind of integrated yes it's much rarer to see a gnome community if there are any right. um, in human societies. They Unless tend to be sort of s individual, um, you know, s who've gone to the city and decided to make their life as a tinker or as an illusionist or something like yeah. that. So. One could argue that Lantan is an exception, but then it's sort of a confined island. Yeah. So, and it, and Lantan is one of those things where where the message kind of got weirdly blurred. So originally Lantan was a uh, sort of land of human inv inventors associated mm -hmm. with Gond, but then because gnomes became tinkerers and then they got associated with Gond, then all of a sudden Lantan was in third edition basically populated with a bunch of gnomes as well. Right. And so it was just... Uh, now we assume it's humans and gnomes living together. Happily. <laughs> Mass hysteria. Wait, no. <laughs> Happily. <laughs> Happily Mass together. Mass hysteria is probably not far from the truth. <laughs> all right, great. Well, I like a lot of this will be uh, uh, cleared up in Mordekainen's yeah. Tome of Foes uh, coming out in 
May, uh, May 18th, May 29th, uh, everywhere else. Um, so, so notable by its absence in Murdy Curdy's term of furs is <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> one of my favorite monsters from third edition's Monsters of Faerun. So this oh was gosh. a Forgotten Realms monster oh gosh. Yes, that was described as <laughs> 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 the halfling's greatest natural no, enemy. No, 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 no. <laughs> stop. Please stop. It what hurts. was it? <laughs> I will say its name, and you can go find a PDF version of uh, Monsters of Faerun, third edition, oh. on DM's Guild, and look it up for yourself. But the monster is called the Tall Mouther. Yeah. The Tall Mouther. Yes. Go look it up. Oh. You'll be richly rewarded. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, for, for people who want to uh, prove that they have done that, uh, where can they tell you that on Twitter? Uh, they can tell me that on Twitter at Chris Perkins DND. Uh, at Cernet, S E R N E T T. And don't send those uh, pictures to, to Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Matt knows all too well the <laughs> perils of the tall mouth. Yes. Excellent. Thank you guys. We'll be back with another lore you should know pretty soon. Thanks. Excellent. All right. Uh, we got 20 minutes or so to do. Uh, sure, we can take a goofy, crack at it. Goofy D&D &D adventures. We want to yeah, talk about it later. Do again, part we can two. Circle around. Sure. Let's do it. <laughs> Goofy adventures. Uh, uh, so many. Uh, <laughs> there's this one. And then there's this one. Where did it all start? Did we start with expedition? Do you want to? I'll, I'll leave it to you guys. To yeah. Oh. Go for all it. Right. Right. Welcome to another segment of Lore You Should Know. I'm Greg Tito, and I'm joined by these amazing lore masters, Mr. Chris Perkins. Howdy. And Matt Cernet. Hello. And this is the segment where we delve into Dungeons & Dragons lore uh, for funsies and for stuff maybe you can use in your game as more background. Uh, but this one's more for the funsies side of things as we delve into goofy slash funny slash amazing D and D adventures of yore. Uh, so yeah, where, what's a good starting point? Oh well, for those who don't know, most D and D adventures are kind of written straight, like no, not an abundance of humor, and that's because we generally assume that a group playing the adventure is going to inject their own brand of humor. And you know, bad right. dice rolls being what they are, everybody's going to have their own be in funny jokes. situations yeah. that are up. There'll be in jokes that are up. So an adventure never has to try particularly hard to be funny. However. Over the years, there have been several, dare I say, hundreds, <laughs> <laughs> hundreds of adventures. You know that have tried that have that have to varying degrees of success. Uh, <laughs> tried uh, too hard. Tackled humor. Yeah. Um, By actually writing it in yes. the rules oh, description. And, some, and, and sometimes it's been very uh, subtle brand of humor, and mm -hmm. sometimes it's been way over the top slapstick, just absolutely goofy beyond compare. Yeah. How do you do that in a script like that, though? How how is it how is it presented? Um, Give me some examples. Straight up, no chaser. <laughs> yeah, straight up, no chaser. All in, baby. All is in. it in the so, the read aloud text? Oh yeah, uh, it's yeah. everywhere. Yeah. It's, oh. in, it's often situational. Like we're gonna pair, we're gonna take something that normally you would think of as a serious thing, and we're going to turn it on its head, or Got pair it. it with something peculiar. What's uh, uh, what's a good example to so, start with? Um, well, first of all, before we jump in, let me just say it's all Gary Gygax's fault. <laughs> okay, <laughs> for for many things, but uh, including because, this, because one of the earliest adventures in the game um, that he designed was an adventure he wrote called Expedition to the Barrier Peaks, mm -hmm. uh, Module S three, which basically had the characters uh, fumbling through the mountains and discovering a crashed spaceship, mm. and then running around inside it, uh, only to find robots, a uh, a robotic exercise instructor or two. And, <laughs> yeah. The wolf in sheep's clothing, which oh is a creature that looks like a tree stump with a little bunny shaped mass on top of it, uh, designed to lure you into its grasp so that it can eat you. Um, it introduced us to the veggie pygmies. Oh, well, the, the veggie pygmies. The, yeah, yeah. They made their first appearance there. Uh, these tall, small, little moldy plant folk uh, born out of uh, fungal spores from a rust from a russet mold. Um, the, the frog hemoth. The frog hemoth was born there. This goofy ass elephantine um, frog monster, uh, and uh, all, of course, rendered in that wonderful kind of Errol Otis style of art that we have uh, grown to know and love. Right. So, because he did that, he basically said. Put aside all that you know about what a D&D adventure is and enjoy this absolutely insane romp uh, with laser guns and other things. 
Um, and that basically set the foundation for what would be a series of goofy ass riffs. Um, and was it because it was this uh, tongue in cheek uh, criticism of science fiction? It was, it was more like a stretch. Uh, he was he was sort of showing you, you think you know what D&D is? Let me show you what D&D is oh. uh, kind of things that uh, he was prone to do. Gary also gave us a later first edition project, first edition venture called Dungeon Land. Mm-hmm. Dungeon Land. Which is D&D's homage to Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. Ah. Okay. Where essentially you fall down a rabbit hole and you encounter the Mad Hatter. You encounter the Dormouse. You encounter the Queen of Hearts. You encounter the Walrus and the Carpenter. All these figures sort of re-rendered in D&D terms. Mm. Um, and often they had their own unique statistics. This was followed up quickly thereafter by Gary Gygax's The Land Beyond the Magic Mirror. The sequel to Dungeon Land, which is of course the sequel to um, Through the Looking, or Through Through the the Looking Glass. Glass is the sequel to Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. And so Gary tackled both books and riffed on them in D&D terms. And I believe at one point in Beyond the, um, the Land Beyond the Magic Mirror, you can actually find a house where there's a bunch of weird gizmos, including a VCR um, <laughs> and various other things that you don't find in the normal world. Was it Gary's house? <laughs> probably, probably. As described. I believe there was like like Merlin, one of the wizards had spent some time there or something, and Merlin's like, you know, guy running around with six shooters and weird ass things. But um, it, it was very, very, it was, it, it again showed that you can have just a good time uh, doing weird ass adventures. In fact, I was so inspired by um, Dungeon Land and Land Beyond the Magic Mirror as a young'un that, um, I wrote an adventure, which I'd later sort of develop and redo for a product called TSR Jam, which was an adventure collection in 1999. Mm. And I wrote an adventure that riffed on Jabberwocky. Um, So so that was basically me just putting on my weird Dungeon Land hat for a while. So Gary was instrumental in um, pushing the humor boundaries and injecting a lot of humor into his stories, often with dark contrast. Yeah. So it kind of worked. Right, because it was. Let it was me, so there's there's a table. If an android in Expedition the Barrier Be- Peaks, oh, uh, <laughs> if it gets to grapple you, there's a table for what it ha- results in. Uh, you know, it's grappling, which includes you know forearm smash, elbow uh, smash, uh, that's, stranglehold. That's the, that's the wrestling. Uh, yeah, trainer. Like, wrestling trainer. Uh, yeah. Leg broken, eardrums <laughs> ruptured, <laughs> eyes gouged out, <laughs> nose bitten off, <laughs> neck broken, dead. Um, <laughs> so, so like, I love rolling it, on a table to find out if my character died. Yeah, it, yeah. it gets dark pretty fast. You just yeah. go to like, yeah, I'll, I'll do a wrestling match with a robot. You know, that sounds yes. cool. Dead, dead. <laughs> so one of the things Gary was known for was, of course, Castle Greyhawk. Um, he had a version of Castle Greyhawk that he ran in his longstanding campaign. That is not the version of Castle yes. Greyhawk that ended up in the classic D and D first edition adventure WG Seven. Castle Greyhawk, okay, yeah, um, which was a collection of adventures written by other people. Um, I can't even say it was loosely inspired by Gary's campaign. No, it, it's it is, it's so crazily it, awry. Yeah, yeah, it's basically a collection of adventures nominally set in Castle Greyhawk. Mm-hmm. That um, this was the first product, the first published TSR adventure, I think, that really kind of went over way into the slapstick. Oh, okay. Crazy, crazy stuff. Like yeah. on one one level of the dungeon is you're hopping on a 747 and fighting a, a bunch of giant bees <laughs> and bee people. You know, like another one, another level is Morden Kanan's magnificent movie set, where you're just basically running around a Hollywood set. Yeah. Oh no, way. really? Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, like, along with like cowboys character and who was and killed and... by I think a gingerbread golem. Right. Oh, yes. yeah. That's pretty yes. terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. So there was a period I think in the. And I don't know what, I can't remember what was happening in the world to warrant this uh, in the early 80s, where a lot of humor started to seep into the adventures. So that mm. may have been a product yeah, of just. It was, and this was lot, in a lot of different things. So, like, I mean, that that's also when, you know, Spelljammer was really a big thing. Mm-hmm. And so tons of Spelljammer adventures are super goofy. One of my favorite um, goofy adventures is, uh, and by favorite, I mean reviled, um, <laughs> <laughs> is City of the Gods. Which, oh, which, uh, I remember is, looking at that cover and being like, what is going on with this? Which is just, uh, I mean, frankly, it's unplayable. Like, the map is insane. <laughs> like, it's just this bizarro map with, 
like thousands of red lines on it, and it's supposed to mean things. And <laughs> and, and then you have these characters in it, like uh, Besoro the Drunkard and uh, Brother Richard the Flying Monk and uh, Bork Riesling. Um, you know, like it's clearly not meant Bork to be taken taken seriously, but it's so so goofy. Is that supposed yeah. to be like a, a, a like a Buck Rogers? I don't know. Parody? I, 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 it's hard Buck for me Riesling? to fathom this adventure, yeah. honestly. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's another sort of delve into the science fiction world where you're basically running around an aircraft carrier. Uh, oh, okay. So it's yeah. like, a, uh, not Gamma World, but uh, 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 what's the one with the A? There, where you, you basically discover you've been playing in a, in a, um, a ship the whole time. Metamorphosis album? That's the one I'm thinking of. Got it. Yeah. yeah, but that also has some goofiness to it, too. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Um, so... Early on, the humor was starting to, you know, cement itself in the product so that by the time, like, say, Dungeon Adventures magazine came out, um, you started to see them cropping up occasionally there as well. Mm. Um, the editors uh, were careful to moderate the amount of humor that they sort of did. But uh, one of the first adventures in – one of the earliest adventures in Dungeon Magazine was in issue three. And this adventure called Fluffy Goes to Heck. <laughs> where you're basically playing pre-generated characters looking for a little dog named Fluffy who has been taken away by the Archduke of Lord of Heck. And so... Was it supposed to be like a kid's adventure? No, it's, a, it's an adventure for adults, but has a very sort of kiddie like quality to it. And mm. the characters are all sort of weird, offbeat names like Kumquat and things like that. Right. Uh, but it was just it was really, really silly. And it actually, there were a series of uh, Heck adventures but they only published that one. Oh, each of the several uh, layers of Heck. Clearly, yes. <laughs> so you have to fully explore Heck to appreciate it. Um, like the, 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 the Lord of Heck was basically this big fat demon guy wearing a diaper. Um, and yeah, it was like, oh, like way, way, yeah. way That way reaction the was pale. every single person who read it. Way but. beyond <laughs> the pale. And, uh, but uh, some of the later adventures, or some of the other earlier adventures were like in issue 21, there was an adventure called Rank Amateurs where you got to play the monsters. Um, you got to play goblins and orcs and hobgoblins going off on an adventure for a hill giant chief. Mm. And so you could run into groups of adventurers or whatever and had to deal with that. Um, and that was kind of fun because it's funny. You're, you're probably not getting too invested in these goblin characters that you're playing. Mm -hmm. uh, but you actually have a mission and a goal that within the world makes sense. that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that goblins do have things that they do. And some, sometimes those things, sometimes the orders that they're given from their stupid superiors um, uh, force them to do things that they wouldn't do otherwise. And that's ki that was kind of a neat way to use humor um, in a way that fit within the context of the world. Yeah. And, and then, then, it, there are definitely adventures that have uh, humorous elements that are still very serious. And so, like, I think of uh, The Lost City, which has the Synodiceans, who are these sort of like crazed cultists of Zargon. And it's. They live under this ziggurat in a desert, basically, and they wear these animal masks and, and they've completely lost themselves. Yeah, they, they act like weird animal people yeah. and like you have to interact with them and, and there's weird fractious things going on there. But then it turns out. The whole adventure is really all about Zargon because it's this weird god monster that lives under the city that's going to rise up at any moment. I mean, it, and it's a yeah. crazy adventure, but you know there are certainly you know humorous and funny elements of it, and I I, I love that. Let's do it. Yeah, <laughs> Let's I've, do it. I've always been a fan of injecting little bits of humor into adventures, um, and sometimes the humor is in adventures where you wouldn't expect it. Take for instance Ravenloft. Yeah, which is many people would say it is not a funny adventure and I'm one of them I mean it's it's straight up gothic horror yeah but when you start crawling around in the catacombs under Ravenloft and you read the names on the different crypts you can see that the writers were having some fun um, a lot of the names are bad puns right um, the the last crypt in the tomb is uh, contains the body of someone named Tatsal Eris <laughs> <laughs> that's all there is that's all there is. <laughs> so, so you have to, but yeah, you have to so know the joke of it. One of the goofiest can... adventures. It's just got some fun in it. If you if you want something that's truly goofy, dig out Dungeon issue number thirty two, an adventure by Willie Walsh called Pearlman's Curiosity, mm. which was the first published adventure to use a Nilbog oh, okay. as the main antagonist. And for those who don't know, the Nilbog, which is goblin spelled backward, is 
uh, was in, in the original Fiend Folio. And it was a monster that basically caused, had this sort of aura around it that would affect people and cause them to do things backwards and start talking backwards. Oh, God. And so this whole adventure is a mystery based on the premise that a village has basically succumbed to Nilbogism. Mm. And people are doing things backwards and talking backwards and leaving backwards messages to each other, and nobody knows why. And so you're basically hunting for the source and trying to find it. Yeah. And there's all the hilarity that ensues and with that. All the hilarity that ensues with that. I remember trying to run it. It was very, very hard to do. I, yeah, I was just going to say, that really depends on the performance yes, of the dungeon exactly, master a lot. Yes, a lot weighed on really the delivery of the dungeon master. Because you can't do it in such a way that it just becomes yeah, nonsensical. How can you naturally talk backward? Yes. Because you know? it was actually each right. word was spelled yes. backwards, right? Exactly. Oosh. Yeah. That's difficult. Yeah. How, so uh, going back a little bit to when Gygax did this and then when others infected this kind of uh, uh, humor into the adventure writing itself, how is that perceived by the fandom and you know letters to the editor that sort of thing varying degrees (laughs) (laughs) i had a friend who was a huge fan of greyhawk and when uh, castle greyhawk came out he was enraged a lot of people were enraged by (laughs) castle greyhawk because they felt like that was that was not simple parody that was almost mockery Mm, um and so you don't you don't mock something as beloved as as castle greyhawk yeah. Unless you're marketing it as like that's what we're trying to do. Right, and right. it wasn't readily apparent. Yes. If you looked at the cover art, for instance, it was a little bit goofy, but sort of in the style at the time, it yeah, sort of fit. I mean, Just yeah. a bunch of monsters basically racing across a drawbridge. Yeah. Um, and you can't you can't just be like, oh, bait and switch, this is a funny thing. Right? right, yeah, you would have had to really been paying attention and reading the back cover copy to understand that this is probably not your, this is not your Grandpa Gary's exactly. uh, Castle Greyhawk. <laughs> Um, and honestly, the tethers to Castle Greyhawk were negligible. It could have been anywhere. Right. It yeah. didn't have to be there. And exactly. I think that's part of what if you don't do the if you don't do the setting justice, then it comes across as mockery. Yeah. And a lot of people don't like Spelljammer because of the amount of humor that was put in the Spelljammer. Right. Um, you know, some people don't like it just because the physics don't work that way. But a lot of people <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> don't like it because of how much humor is just inherent in the setting with GIF and deck apes and all kinds of things. Miniature like that. giant space hamsters. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And yeah. People don't, people, and I mean, I guess there's a different taste for, for, for every kind of Dungeons and Dragons game. We're like, oh, I'm into this gothic horror or, you know, this intrigue or something, something like that. And for whatever reason, those little, you know, it's, it's hard to run a serious a simulationist yeah. game with that as the source material. Well, yeah. especially when it's, it's sort of the main dish. Uh, I think Planescape managed to have a lot of humorous elements in it, but they ended up being kind of side dishes. So the mm. Modrons are really weird uh, and honestly kind of creepy if you think about them too hard. Um, <laughs> but... But they're, they're a side dish to the other side. I mean, there's lots of weird, you know, um, speech patterns and so on presented in the products and um, sort of, and that lended kind of a sense of humor to a lot of it. Uh, there was a lot, of, but a lot of the humor and jokes and so on in, in the books themselves were kind of dark because it was kind of a dark setting. And so I, I think Planescape managed to skirt the edge of that without, you know, falling down. Yeah. Yeah. There's something to be said, too, about, uh, as you, that, like, most humor at the table comes from the players, comes from them. So if, right. if you're trying to do the source material and the normal humor that would come yeah. about it, I could see that yeah. being difficult. Yes. And if you want to get away from humor, just a second, just talk about Goofy. One of the other early adventures in D&D's history that falls on the Goofy side of the radar yeah. is um, Queen of the Demon Web Pits. Re- yeah. Really? That's yes. Goofy? And I'll tell you why. So for those who don't know, um, Queen of the Demon Web Pits is the culmination of a long series of adventures that started with the A series, which is the the Slavers series, followed by the Giants series, which is the G series, and, or sorry, uh, followed by the Giants series, and then followed by the D series, which is the Drow series. Uh, All those basically swell up into module Q1, Queen of the Demon Web Pits. When you find- search turns something up for Switch. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> speaking of goofy, yeah, speaking of goofy <laughs> my phone is listening to this conversation um which okay. is which which basically takes the story into the abyss the the 66th layer or whatever to fight loth the demon queen of spiders yeah gary had written all the adventure or had written that sort of the um the giant series adventures and the drow centric adventures and wanted to write Queen of the Demon Pits, but ran out of time because he was tied up with Temple of Elemental Evil. Mm-hmm. So he handed the ball off to David C. Sutherland, who finished it, uh, basically turned over a design draft. Right. And the web, the demon web itself, was sort of like this weird crisscrossing maze of corridors with a bunch of doors leading off into extra-dimensional spaces, which you could search. But in the end, you fight Loth where? Aboard a spaceship. Oh. Loth's 
Lair is a giant spider shaped spider shaped spaceship. In um, realm space or or in, in Greyhawk in, space or whatever. In the abyss. It's just sitting in the abyss. You can walk up to it, you can climb aboard it and start like pushing buttons and flipping levers and actually cause it to walk like a spider and, oh. and move around. Um, so uh, I remember when I <laughs> when I picked up that adventure and I, I was already sort of starting my players into the giant series, and I read that section. I'm like, you've got to be fucking kidding. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to get all the way to the end of this multi-series, multi-series, multi-part module series, thinking they're going to fight Loth in some abyssal location, right. and it turns out to be a giant metal spider ship. Was it stepping on the it, web of the dungeon that no, you were just traveling just sort of on? No, it parked somewhere. You know, oh. in a lot somewhere, <laughs> uh, and you just stomp around it. And yeah. you can you can sort of try to figure out how the controls work and maybe Flip down the maybe cause it to walk around and do out. other things. Yeah, uh, exactly. I mean, there are other artifacts in the game that are like I mean, in in magic items. So um, yeah. you know, the apparatus of Qualish kind of has that aspect of it. Um, the machine of Lum the Mad. Machine of Lum the Mad, and 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 so on. So, so there's like a thread of button pushing and lever pushing in D and D, um, and and it always comes with a little bit of goofiness. Like, as soon as you put a big red button on something, <laughs> goofy things are going to happen. <laughs> Candy-colored red button. Yeah, right. yes. Yeah. yes. So, so, so weird things happen. So Makes yeah. sense. So that, that was my first real encounter with sort of old series goofiness that kind of I found abrasive at the time. Yeah. I can look back on that adventure now with fondness. And I, it would be fun to actually surprise the players in with, that way. With that is what's happening. Yes, but at the time, the level of goofiness just was completely off-putting to me. Makes sense. At, at that tender age, whatever I was. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right. Well, that's uh, hopefully that all informed where we are now with uh, with creating adventures. Uh, like you said, like with the Curse of Strahd, when you were doing that, you I, I remember you were trying to make there be some uh, some humor uh, as yeah, part just of sort it. Of in, to, I was pacing. trying to be faithful to the original adventure by yeah. having an equal amount of humor to what the original adventure had. Yeah, because if yes. you're all dark, all awful all the time, it, that can often right. become yes. as off-putting as it so being all when, goofy when, all the When hundreds. I had my chance to stamp a name on one of the crypts, I chose uh, Elsa von Twitterberg. She had a lot of followers. <laughs> uh, I think I follow her. Yes. Uh, so thank you. That is a great uh, quick walk through some goofy D&D adventures. Maybe we'll revisit this topic with some more. Uh, there are so many more goofy so many and funny more. adventures out there. We really we just scratched the surface. Scratched the surface. Uh, where can people point out their f- most favoritist, most reviled uh, goofy adventures to you? Uh, I live aboard a drow spaceship. <laughs> <laughs> on press the, the red button. layer of, of the abyss. <laughs> uh, and you can reach me at uh, Twitter at Chris Perkins DND. I am under a ziggurat, and <laughs> <laughs> I am being at worshipped <laughs> by mask wearing <laughs> yes, and infidels. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I am uh, at Cernet, S E R N E T T. And uh, you can follow me at Elsa Von Twitterverse. Yeah. I <laughs> will answer all your questions there. Uh, thank you guys for that lore. You should know segment. We'll be back uh, next week with some more fun stuff. Talk to you soon. Bye bye. And Chris Lindsay's laughing in the corridor. Outside, I yeah. was like, so stressful. I'm like, he's going to come in here. And laugh at us. Uh, thank you, Twitch people. Uh, we are going to quickly reset for Morning Cannon's Mayhem. It is round number seven. Uh, thank you to everyone who has subscribed so far. We're going to play a short bit of ads as we set up. Uh, for those of you who hadn't subscribed, you will be able to watch Pelham do his magic. Thank you, everyone. See you later. I will be not here next week. That's all you got to care. Bye-bye.